Amen. 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 I, I said uh, a few things ahead of myself, and uh, some of those things I wrote in two things, so I want to share some of these with you, because they tie into what we're talking about today. And next Sunday, oh my gosh, um, I want to talk to you uh, about journaling, and I want to share some, uh, a handout with you that I've uh, been putting together and worked on it while we were in Mountain View, Arkansas, and uh, just gearing up for next Sunday, because it's really important. I want everybody to be here. Be ready to take good notes for that. So there's some things that I think all of you need so much in your, in your daily lives. Amen. You know, last Sunday we shared with you about how 80% of what you do, anybody can do. Anybody. Anybody. I mean, with well, that, you know, saying whatsoever, anybody can do what you do. 80% of what you do, anybody can do. We told you about how 15% of what you do with some sort of training. Uh, if you take the service with some sort of training, 15 percent of what you do, uh, somebody could be trained to do that, and they could do that, and you wouldn't have to do that. But the last what? Five percent. The last five percent. Only you can do. Nobody can do that in prophecy. Only you can be a good husband and be a good wife. Only you can leave the legacy to your children. Only you. Uh, can, can do uh, the things that you do that are so pleasing to your character, your integrity, your life. And you know, uh, uh, that 5%, uh, the most ultimate part of that 5% is that, um, uh, the most ultimate part is that that 5% is what you and I will be good for. And how much promise can we God and how close we are to Him? So the Bible says, you are close to God and you're what? Well, God says to you, you're the one who's supposed to do the plan. You're the one who's hungry and thirsty after him. Amen. You have to talk to you. You don't expect it to be real to your kids or your family or anybody at your work. And they're going to know you by your mind, by how you act, by how you walk, by how you talk, what you do when you go outside these doors. They're going to know you. You're going to leave an example. No talk is said so hard. Can you say amen? It's just said you can tell a lot about a person by what it takes to bring them down. Yeah. You know, 95% of the, uh, of the stuff we deal with, who doesn't say about 95% of the stuff we deal with from the devil party? Well, you can start to believe the talk. Listen to me. 95% of what you do, you have a choice. And you're living in the freedom. You hear me? 95% of what you do, the devil's not omnipotent. He's not omnipotent. 95% of what you do, you made a decision. It's my thing. I'm going to do what I want to do. Right? You're doing your thing. Well, I don't want to be spiritual. Well, that's fine. That's on you. You're going to get an account for every word. Amen. See, uh, yeah, ninety-five percent of what we deal with most of the time is not a devil problem. You have a you and me problem. Your decisions, your choices, your issues. So you receive wisdom, and you do your thing, you get to suffer the consequences. If you want to know the divine nature and the divine freedom, then you must spend time with him. Amen. Amen. You know, my mentor, my tutor. Oh. The more I draw upon him, the more he uh, shows me how to walk with a firm footing. So the Bible talks about the steps of a righteous man or woman. The steps of a righteous man or woman. The word steps means a consistent, steady walk. But it's all that you draw upon, God. Think in his face, giving a hold of him. Uh, you know, uh, uh, you know Mar- Martha put herself in a position. She put herself in the position that she was in. And say again. Martha, I'm talking about Mary Martha right now. Martha chose. Martha chose to put herself in the condition that she was in. Mary chose to put herself in the condition that she was in. Can you hear me? If that being said, let me get into what I want to talk to you about. Right now. You know, um, the 119th Psalm, verse 24, we shared it with you last week, says, Your testimonies. 
Your testimonies also are my delight. They are my counsel. Your testimonies. Now what so and so said, I mean so and so might have said good things. And maybe so and so might have preached a good message. And I'm telling you, it will need to be personal with you or it will mean nothing to you. So it's like you start and feel lucky about it, then you forget about it later. Are you listening to me? Now you feel about the flesh and the good. So what you do in your quiet time, when you close the door, that's on you. Your testimony are my delight. They are my counsel. They speak to me. Amen. So the Bible says in Proverbs 4, 23, which is in the NIV, it says, above all else, God. I just say God. Guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Guard your heart. I just say guard my heart. It's your responsibility to guard your heart. You know, in the Living Bible, it reads like this. It says, above all else, guard your affections, for they influence everything in your life. God's your effect is what you give to is going to control you, going to control your mouth, going to control your attitude. I mean, you'll be known by those things. You'll be known by your effect. You'll be known by what you will to. Amen. People know you. Oh, gosh, they will. So they influence everything in your life. Here's another translation. Amplified Bible. It says this. He can guard your heart with all vigilance and above all of it to so all that it flows the springs of life. It's not the one they do. I don't know what to get there. Amen. Uh, you know, we need to keep and guard your heart above, with all business and above all that you guard. For so all that it flows the springs of life. You know, we, we, we think a lot of things are important to us, whether it's a phone. I love watching, there's a clip going around on the internet, and we've been, uh, if you're a Back to the Future fan, uh, I watched it, I loved it. You know, uh, on Jimmy Kimmel, they had uh, old Doc Brown and Marty McFly come out into the glory and down the street. I don't know if anybody saw that clip, but it was something. Uh, and you know, uh, 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 they, they, they get out of the car, the clouds are scaring them, you know, and that great thing for us. Uh, uh, um, Michael, uh, Jack J. Fox and the Christopher Lord, you know, they were enjoying the moment. Even Huey Lewis was in the crowd. It's probably just been totally cool. He even did that maneuver. Um, but, you know, when uh, uh, old Mr. Kimmel had his phone out, he said, uh, uh, they asked him, said, uh, have you created uh, uh, what, no flying cars? No, no, we never figured out the flying cars. Um, um, and they say, well, what about, uh, what about the hoverboards? Well, you know, we have what they call a hoverboard, but it's really not a hoverboard. But how about the Cubs? Well, that's true. The Cubs made the playoffs. Yeah. But then they were like, okay, Jesus didn't come back. <laughs> okay. All right, Cubs, you can say, you know, Jesus is going to come back and buy him over at his last game. And, you know, the is loaded. And, you know, it's good or done. And all of a sudden, the last game team keeps it again. And we're all going to go home. And Joel just said, go, anyway, I know that. They started talking, and, you know, uh, Mr. Kimmel started doing a selfie with uh, Doc Brown and Marty. And they started looking at the phone, and he just smiled at them. And he the picture. And, and Doc Brown goes, hey, Doc. So they all, it's a, it's a kind of smart phone. We use these things to document moments in our lives. And he takes the phone, and he makes this statement. I thought it was really powerful. kind of fit what I'm talking about today. <laughs> it's, a, it's a super computer model. We can, we can do all sorts of stuff. You know, there's more technology in your phone than what landed the lunar module on the moon. You know that, don't you? I mean, more. I mean, just the watch. The eye, the eye watch out there has got more technology in it than what they use to land the lunar module. And it's a super computer. It's a personal super computer. So all the equations, all the things we can factor in, all the time travel we can do with this. <laughs> so, so oh, well, no, no, we don't use it quite for that. We just think smiley faces to each other. <laughs> and text. And, um, Michael J. Fox, can I check with this? It's a cost, but it's a clean kind of thing. It's very funny. Our phones have made life very impersonal. People don't know how to talk to people. 
and in the body of Christ, it's called people to disconnect from the church, to disconnect from the spirituality, and to disconnect from the body of God. I know some of you here, you live by your technology. But you know, to develop your personality, you gotta open your mouth and communicate. You know, everything about your life is going to take more than your hands. A smartphone is better than any relationship with God, I think, to become. I hate to use this word, and the way I'm going to use it is for us to say. We as the body of Christ have become very shallow. They have to get a clean thing. They have to get a soft track to you. They have become bored too quickly. We lose sight of the power of our relationship. Don't look me to them. See them. That's why the Bible gets to keep and guard your heart. With all those wisdom above all that you got, or out of it flow the things of life. I want to tell you a story today. Can I get my point even more? You know, one fine summer day in the year 1606. I'm going to say 1606. Well, that's a long time ago, wasn't it? In the year 1606, there was a grove of towering sequoias in a place that would become known as California. A time of season picked up through the virgin soil, drawing energy from the filter of sunlight that was streaming in. This filter of sunlight in between all the towering sentinels in the forest. The infant lifted its miniature arms to the light and warmth that had awakened it. A year later, the seedling turned into a stocking. The London Company established the downtown settlement in Virginia. A year after that, as a stockman, that stockman really became a very young sequoia tree. An adventurer during that time, by the name of Samuel de Chapman, found a Quebec city in New France, a territory that would later become known as Canada. After three more years, this sequoia grew and grew and was already topped to a point of 11 feet high. And it was towering, starting to tower above the forest floor. And at that time, a group of scholars released an elegant English translation of the Bible. And some of you have in your, in your libraries a, a translation of the Bible that would be known as the King James Version. Well, in the year 1618, when the tree was nearly two stories high, Europe became involved in a conflict that history books would one day call the Thirty Years' War. As the tree continued to grow, well, America became a nation. All the Civil War joined Europe in fighting two, not one, but two world wars, put men on the moon. In a survey of the morning, and suffered at the hands of terror from the other end. Through all those events, standing centuries, the seedling became a towering titan, a towering titan of the forest, soaring to second, is that it was soaring up to over 240 feet in the California country. Going all the way back to the 1600s. Well, you know, a couple of years ago, out of nowhere, the tree I'm talking to you about fell to the ground with the cross. Fell to the ground. It's tremendous cross, thunderous cross. You could hear it, the rangers heard it. It was the first of the assembly's magnificent sequoias to fall in many, many years. In fact, it concerned the Forest Service so much that they authorized an investigation to find out why and how it fell, what caused it. And they, 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 they investigated why did this 
force, if we experience force causes huge, over 240 pounds to coil and hit the ground. Why? What would cause such a majestic tree to fall to a fall? There's been no windstorms, there's been no fires, there's been no floods, there's been no lightning strikes. In fact, the tree toppled, the tree that toppled it didn't even show any sign of insect damage or any kind of animal damage. But as the park rangers and the forest experts examined the down the tree, they came to a strong conclusion of what caused that tree to fall. It was a Crossing foot traffic over its roots. An interviewer on one of the cable networks on the news uh, channel, an interviewer was asking uh, one of the rangers involved in the team that was investigating. And this, the park ranger explained he said foot traffic around the base of the tree over the years to damage the root system so much that it contributed to the collapse of the giant sequoia, the passing of the forest. In fact, the park service uh, made decisions and they see the rule that they would put up fences up around the oldest giants to protect the guard and save their roots. Now, I know you're looking at the past, but what's this whole story about the Sequoia itself? What's that got to do with my life? Well, there's a lot of spiritual significance to what I'm telling you about today. Because what is true to the Sequoia is true to you and me. We have de- a delicate root system. Each of us have a delicate root system. In fact, your root system is more fragile than you give yourself credit to. Your root system is very fragile. More fragile than you could ever imagine. And unless you find a way to protect and nourish those roots, you will fall too. You will fall. I want to give you some examples of why you fall. You are weakness. And spiritual things and having any kind of spiritual life, you're weakness because you don't have a physical breakdown. Yeah. Cause you to, if your body to break down, cause you to lose sight of who the healer is. Cause you to walk into some emotional problems. Maybe you're insecure in some areas and you never go past that because you don't know the one who sets you free from your insecurity. Your weak system is underdeveloped and you can't stand question. The attitude keeps you from being promoted. And you never spend time with the ones you can do to learn how to walk that path you on. Instead of promotion, you end up stuck in setbacks. Your root system could cause you to have a moral collapse, moral failure. You spend all your time taking escapes. Are looking at men behind Thinking about things you should Because your root system is very strong. And you know all the cares of life? Well, you know no much problem with your root system. In fact, some of us get so caught up in the cares of life and the affairs of others that we allow whining and complaining and gossiping and carrying on and gossip, all those things that control our lives. Instead of our mentor, our tutor, to learn not to curse the word mission. We become so weak. But you know, sometimes we don't even realize how gradually we're walking across our roots with all that stuff. How that weakens us and how that turns our lives into a weak, weakened state. And how, listen, we erode our personality. We feel the essence of who we are and who we can be in Christ Jesus and who God has called us to become. Do we follow that? And every one of you in here, we always quote Psalm 1 and verse uh, 1 through 3. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the land of the world. And in his law he meditates day and night. He should be like the what? Tree. 
planted by the waters of life. Those waters that bring forth its fruit, your fruit, in its season. Your leaf, whose leaf shall not wither, and wherever he and whatever he does, it shall what? We lost out of relationship. Jesus warned us. He said, you know, the disciples were asking, and I even put a little article about this together once. And you go look it up. It's on my blog. It's on my Facebook note page. But, you know, uh, the four, uh, those four characteristics that uh, I listed out about what the last days would be like. People will, will get tired and don't want to go after spiritual things anymore. People will quit giving. People will quit doing the things they don't God's called them to do. But they care more about doing power and food than they do about taking care of what keeps them straight, keeps them right, keeps them from being lost in the world of sin. God's called each of you to do your things. If you've allowed yourself to become so shallow that you are not walking in the relationship that we want to remember. Remember. God you to do that too, that those four can speak. But your leaf doesn't wither. And everything you set your hands to is healthy. You know, my daily time before the seed of Christ Jesus allows the divine nature, listen, my daily time, my daily time, I can talk to you today, but listen to me. My personal five to six, my daily time. At the feet of Christ Jesus allows the divine mentor to have access to me. My daily time makes me strong, makes me that tree that's always blessed, never withered. My daily time brings me face to face with the Creator of the universe. Who knows it all? It can lead me. The greatness, the greatness that he called me to. And today, he is calling to you because he wants you to step into the greatness that he's always had to you. Remember what I said about Mary and Martha. I said a little bit before we started that we're excited. Mary and Martha, you know. Talk about Mary and Martha, talk about wine as a complainer, people who say they're bored, people don't know what they should do. You know, you can hear stuff like that. Guarantee you, 99.9% of the time, I'm going to look at you and say, How much time are you spending with the Lord? How much time are you spending in the Word? How much time are you personally spending in the Word? Amen. That's the friend of mine. I've met this man, and I've been reading his book over and over. Uh, I didn't realize I met him until uh, I was reminded about something that Dave Kaufman did years ago uh, when I worked at Money Hunt. And I remember meeting this thing and him talking about uh, keeping your heart young by spending time with them. And, um, you know, I look back over my shoulder, you know, I think, oh, you know, Lord's done a lot of good things in our lives, but. You know, that's how quick it is. You know, all of a sudden it hit me about how important it was that I don't become shy on it. I'm good about being consistent, doing things a certain way, period. Good about that. It's important. I think consistency is vital to our survival and our personal life. But you know what? Usually, if you're not spending time with God, you'll show up in your attitude and how you act, how you walk, how you talk. You'll show up. You know, Mary and Martha, Martha wouldn't have been wanting and complaining if she would have what was right. When the Jesus told her, he said, I mean, if you think the necessary, really only one, Mary has chosen the good part, which will not be taken away from her. I told you about the truth and the consequences, right? You know, we choose uh, uh, to stay quiet and spend the time alone with the Lord. It's our choice, your choice. For wisdom and consequences, so if we told you wisdom teaches you a lesson before you make a mistake, consequences will demand that you make a mistake, and only then, only then, will it teach you a lesson. And we told you there's two teachers, this is the two teachers in lives, and two pains. Two pains, discipline and what? Two guilt. And not only are neither ones are always convenient, and nobody wants to have regret, but you know, discipline's not always a pretty thing either, is it? 
So this is what you have to say. Amen. In fact, you know, uh, whether it's convenient or not, it's possible. If you yield the discipline, it's that clear benefit. The pain of this is the discipline that's a lot less than the pain of eating that. In fact, you know, Luke describes Martha as distracted. I was looking at that this week. You know, Luke describes Martha, one of the comments that I was looking at, describes Martha as being distracted. How many of us have been distracted with stuff? Stuff! In fact, she was distracted with separation. In fact, the word literally means, you ready for this? The word literally means she was pulled about. I don't care if it's a little bit. You know, he's trying to look over here and do stuff. You're distracted and you're pulling him everywhere it wants to go. And when he becomes so caught up in, in where the distractions are taking him, he's lost what he's supposed to be focused on. In fact, he gets to the place where he can't find it. Now, the believers are going to be lost that way. And in trouble, they look for some answer. And their words will be something to help them. Listen, you better be doing this. You better be doing the word now. You better be doing the word now. You better be doing the word now. Can we talk about now, Pastor? I'll just say, okay, this is what I understand it even more. All right, you ready? Jesus said only a few things are necessary, really only one. Now he shows the good part. It can never be taken away from me. That's what he's saying. Well, let me put it to you a different way as we wrap this up this morning. Your sacred youth system, your time alone with your mentor, your tutor, gaining his wisdom of the ages, it is something, all something that you do and you do. But that quote, listen, the choices that you make the choices that you made regarding the foundation of your life has eternal implications that go way beyond your lifespan on this earth. Paul told his young friend Timothy, he said, you know something, Timothy? Young pastor Ken, he said, Timothy, you know, physical training good. The training for godliness is, is much better. Promising benefits in the life, in this life, and in the life life. I've talked about this verse a lot, but boy, nothing means more true when you talk about a root system. What I do right now is that day on my life now, but it's that day for the next one. See, inside of us, inside of us, folks, there's a yearning, always a yearning, for you and me to spend time with you, to spend time with you. In fact, again, Jesus said, that when you boil all of life down to the basics, when you think of uh, terms of time and eternity, really, not much is really important. In fact, Jesus told us, He said, no, really, really, only one thing is essential. And I believe He's asking all of us, we you choose that part that that will never be taken away from you? Will you? Will you choose to stay quiet and reflect your time alone with the Lord? Or will you allow all the distractions of life to pull you into a frazzle? Cause you to lose control. Cause you to give up on things because you just can't handle things anymore. And all because you know, when you get down to it, I'm not going to spend the time with the one who gives me strength. But the one who gives me power, but the one who 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 shows me his divine wisdom, so that I can walk and fulfill the race and the mission that God's called me to. You know why Paul was so successful? He gave an example. I forget what lies behind. I trust towards what's ahead. Amen. He married, made her choice. We need to make ours. Again, Proverbs four twenty three: Watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. He has joined us to build a sacred enclosure around the headwaters of our life, a sacred enclosure around our root system. He called us to take care to protect the inner spring that nourishes us 
and to do it right. And basically everything that we will ever, ever do in life, to tell us, yes, to touch it, to touch it on everything. And it is the part that can never be taken away from you unless you give it up. Now God, He got it. He told us about it. He understood that it couldn't be taken away. In fact, He made this statement for it to be free. You know, He didn't understand His forfeit. Paul was at the end of His day. He's about to be murdered. And he writes these words. I mean, my gosh, I think he would have obtained everything, don't you? I think he would have made it. He traveled, he put the gospel everywhere. In fact, we're sitting here in church today because of Paul's faithfulness. Oh, no! The victims of the church came from this man who gave his life, who never quit, who stood his ground. And even towards the end of his life, I don't think he was have uh, saved at all. Had a powerful relationship with God. Because the last part of his life, he writes these words that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. I love the way we answer that, brother. I'd like to close your eyes and hear these words today. With your eyes closed, bow your head with me. I want you to hear these words. And I want you to think of them in a personal way. Because the way it's written in the Amplified is very powerful. Listen to these words. For my determined purpose is that I may know Him. For my, that I may become progressively more deeply and intimately acquainted with Him. To see Him. And recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly, more clearly, and that I may in that same way tend to know the power of flowing from his resurrection, which is the first over us as believers, and that I may so serve his suffering as to be continually transforming his spirit into his likeness, even to his death. And the hope that is possible, I may attain to the spiritual and moral resurrection that lifts me out from among the dead, even while in the body. Look at me. Paul's one telling us that I can become, I want to become more intimate with the person who comes from God. Some of you have gone through different things in your life. Everyone in here has said, Well, I thank God Jesus is with you. Some of you have suffered things, moved from jobs, things, locations in your life, things in geography. How many of you got all sorts of things? And you look back and say, Where would I be if not been for Jesus? Some of you went through divorce, you had a death in the family, something happened. And you look back and you think, Oh my God. Where would I be without Jesus? And you realize how powerful and how important this relationship is because it is the, the one factor that sustains you when the fire comes, when the storm rages. It's that one factor that says, I'm going to rock, and Jesus is the rock. He is God. And here he is at the end of his day. I want to know him now. I want to know him more intimately. I want to know him to his purpose. And I want to become acquainted with him in a deep personal way. And I want to understand the wonders of his person. Tell me he could do it now, not then. That's why when we get to heaven, we know there'll be rewards that'll be given out. What are you doing with this word? Do you know him? The next week I want to share about him. Hey, Rick, how you doing? Hey, Rick, how you doing? I'm doing good, God. How are you? You know what? I'm tired of talking about this. Would you like to come and do it for all the time? Yeah? 
If somebody were to describe you today and say this, if someone were to describe you today by your habits, would one of those habits be your daily quiet time? All of us in here this morning, all of us can celebrate with the crowd for God. But you are the only one who can get to know him one on one. It's hard to hear his voice in a multitude as when you're surrounded by distractions. But see, when you are alone with him, time when you stand in solitude, that's when you can really hear him. Thank you. 